please read this disclaimer. This videos all the character and all of its contents, including any disease and opinions expressed by the narrator, are strictly for entertainment purposes only. Each person must make their own life decision, and those decisions are theirs. Hey there, amazing audience who've joined the revolving time today. Get ready to embark on an unforgettable adventure with us. Subscribe now, and let's uncover the hidden secrets and truths together. Life has a curious way of throwing unexpected curveballs our way, doesn't it? Well my friends, today's story is published by 012Say. Wife is going to give birth to a baby, and it would be apparent her husband wasn't the baby's father. This story could be in a variety of categories, and you will enjoy this. Henry and I sat enjoying coffee after a nice breakfast among the four of us. He and his wife Michaela were flying back home this evening, and there was much to do. Henry Jefferson and his wife had been our guests from the 5th of November until today, December 9th. During that time, my wife had given birth to Henry's beautiful daughter. But this is not a tale of some unusual lifestyle where I would condone my wife conceiving a child by another man. Henry is a black man, 69 years of age, married for more than 50 years to his beautiful wife. They have no children, but they have had an extraordinary marriage and life together. I am Bob Walters, two years my wife, Julia Sr., my wife and I are white. But this isn't an interracial tale, nor is it a story about a romance between generations. This is a tale, unbelievable as it might sound. You might as well listen in as we make a video for Grace, our beautiful baby girl. We walked upstairs to Grace's bedroom. We had previously set three folding chairs in the room, joining the comfortable rocker, and found Michaela and Julia already seated. Michaela was in the rocking chair, lovingly holding the baby. Julia handed me her tablet, which we were going to use to film the video and said, Who's going to start? I looked at Henry, and he offered, Why don't you Bob? She is your daughter, and she will want to know her story from you. Both wives nodded in agreement. Michaela and Henry had decided they wanted to be called Nana and Gramps, but I'll get to that a little later. So, I handed Henry the tablet, with it set for video, and showed him where to press to begin recording. Grace, I began. Today is December 9th. You are just about a month old. I am here with your mother, and the people you've always heard referred to as Nana and Gramps. We want to tell you several love stories which came together on Valentine's Day, earlier this year. The story really goes back more than 50 years. But Valentine's Day is the day it came together. Our plan is to show you this video on your 18th birthday. I look straight at the camera. All your life you have heard that while we were in Paris, we ran into an unbelievable situation, and thanks to Henry, there were no eye injuries, and we became a family. We never really said it, but the implied message was your mother was taken by someone and Henry saved her. The tale is much less straightforward than that. I walked over and knelt beside my beautiful wife. Grace, your mother, and I met nearly six years ago. I was a salesman for an insurance agency, and she worked in the office. We started dating and were quickly in love. I had developed an app. It was a social media platform, and it was beginning to catch on. It had over 10,000 members. I looked up at Julia and smiled. We married, and this beautiful woman convinced me to quit my job and make my app a household name. We lived in her small apartment and did without most everything, but love. But the program grew and grew. Your mother and I had been married about two years when one of the big tech giants began to see us as competition. They offered me a huge sum to buy me out. I laughed and told them not for double. We were scared to death, Julia interrupted. The truth was the offer was only a couple of million under our price. But we agreed on a minimum price. And your dad and I never go against what we agreed. So he walked away. I am glad you added that, sweetie. I would have left out our agreement. I turned my face to the camera. Grace, your mother and I are devoted to one another and always have been. 
because of our agreement, and my flamboyantly turning down an offer of a huge sum of money. The giant came back a couple of months later and offered twice, plus a little more. Julia spoke again. I nearly fainted when he told me. He is so thoughtful. He came home to tell me. I think he feared he'd have to catch me. We changed from among the working less than poor to the elite, in one step, in one day. We moved from a one-bedroom apartment to this beautiful home. She stopped again and smiled at me to continue. So, Grace, that is a quick look at our first few years. I was 26, your mom 24, and we decided the most important thing in the world was a family. We decided we'd start that with a romantic trip to Paris. That trip was to include a cruise down the Seine on the evening of Valentine's Day. I think that is as far as I will go. Why don't you introduce yourself, Henry? Henry handed me the tablet. Dear Grace, I hope by the time you see this, I am still around. Unlike your parents, I am 69. When you are 18, I will, or would, be 87. But, as you'll see, it is important you know who I am and who my beautiful bride is as well. Henry grabbed one of the folding chairs and moved it over by Michaela and Grace. He sat and continued. Michaela is the only woman I have ever loved. We were an item in high school. She was a cheerleader, and I was a player on all the sports teams, though not a star on any of them. We decided I had to go to college, get a degree and get a good job. We lived in Atlanta, and I was admitted to Emory. Michaela got a fairly good job, and I got one as a night janitor. We started our life together. I got good grades and starting my second year, I had a solid scholarship. I could quit my full-time job and focus more on studies. I graduated with honors and started working for Autotech. Autotech supplied electrical components for every vehicle built in America, including those built by German and Japanese companies. I rose through the ranks and was president and coup when I retired at age 65. Michaela had stopped working when I graduated and started at Autotech. I say she stopped working, I mean for pay. My beautiful wife has been my partner and a big part of every success I have had. We were working early in an era of affirmative action, and she and I wanted to achieve because we could, not because someone else thought we should. Henry paused and reached out and took Michaela's hand. She smiled, squeezed it and returned her attention to the baby. Henry continued. As people started working for me, we entertained in our home. Michaela saw to it, these people saw that black people are not different from other people, and we gained friends and supporters of all races. We were the perfect team. Henry took on a more serious look. But a corporation is a terrible mistress. Our corporate mistress kept both of us working right up until retirement. There was always something keeping us from just being us. Michaela ran half of the charities in our hometown. She took longer to unwind from her activities than I did. H asterisk LL, oh pardon my language, once a factory guy, always a factory guy. My point is what she did was more important than a mere company president. Henry, sweet as you are, you are wandering. What are you trying to tell this sweet bundle? Michaela cuddled Grace. So, by the time we had retired and withdrawn from charitable work, we were 68, had been married nearly 50 years, and had never been on a honeymoon. We decided that Paris was the city for lovers, and we would go there for our honeymoon, a bit belated. Henry stopped and laughed at the absurdity. We scheduled a cruise down the Seine on Valentine's Day evening. It seemed the romantic thing to do. Of course, it seemed that way looking at a brochure in warm months. The reality was quite different. The ship was not overly crowded, except those of us in attendance were all huddled in the small inner lounge. The decks were nearly deserted. Michaela and I decided we wanted to see the city of lights from the deck and move toward the door. At the door, a young white couple had the same thought, apparently, and deferred to us to let us go out first. The four of us stood closely together near the stern of the ship. The city was stunning. Henry, 
let me tell this next part. Michaela looked at him and Henry merely nodded. Both men went to the rail and turned almost at the same time. Julia and I walked toward them and suddenly the boat lurched. We were in the process of docking. I spun and fell to my left. Fortunately, there was a chair and I literally fell into it. Far from graceful, but a woman my age falling violently to the deck could have resulted in a serious injury. It was maybe a minute before I had my wits about me. She smiled at me. Bob, I believe you're up. I handed the tablet back to Henry, and he pointed it at me. I had seen a ring that opened some hatch and was jutting out of the boat deck. I bent down and had grabbed it as the ship lurched. I had secured my position and did not lurch, as did everyone else. Julia ended up being thrown into Henry's arms. As I stood, I was shocked. Henry and Julia were gazing at one another. Before I could say anything, he took her arm and they moved back into the lounge. Michaela was screaming for Henry to come back. My first instinct was to see if I could help a woman who'd just taken a fall. I had a thought that maybe Henry was hurt, too and Julia was helping get him inside. He didn't look hurt, but it was too bizarre to believe my wife would leave me months after I became extraordinarily rich. For a man her grandfather's age, who she literally tipped into as a boat ducked. Update. Grace, my dear child, this is where the story starts to be different from what you've heard all your life. We were sworn to secrecy as were you, before we'd show you the video. Here are the events you never heard. My phone pinged. I had a text. Surely, Julia was letting me know where she was. I looked at the phone and read the text. I am sorry. All on me. Look up and to your left. I stopped for a moment and stared down at our baby, as though looking at her sincerely would help her understand. I looked up and turned my head to the left. As God is my witness, what I saw just could not be. It was a cherub with a bow, a quiver of arrows, and nothing else. I looked around to see if anyone else saw this cherub, but no one else was looking. When I looked back, there was nothing. Michaela said, Bob, I swear you are as bad as Henry. Of course, there was nothing. I was fit to be tied. My man can get single-minded sometimes and do what is in front of him instead of what he is supposed to do. I was, shall I say, in a foul mood and sharing that mood with as many people as I could. This nice man came and said many things which sounded quite urgent, but he said them in French. I continued my complaints in English, and he scurried off. She looked up at me and said, Tell her why we were delayed. Grace, Grace as you see even family can have difficulties telling a story together. The man was replaced a few minutes later by a woman, who spoke particularly good English. She found me trying to calm Nana, and now I had this vision of a winged baby with a bow and arrows running around in my mind. Maybe the lurching broke something loose in my brain. The woman wanted to know if we were alright. Michaela wanted to know if this woman had seen her husband and a young white woman. The young French woman assured us that several had been shaken up and were being looked after by members of the crew. We need not be concerned. I paused for a minute to gather my thoughts. The woman asked us to go inside, out of the cold. There was no one in the upper lounge. She said they were in the room below, on the main level of the boat. She asked us about our concerns. I allowed Michaela to go first, and the young woman made sure Nana could walk and bend without issue. She was very caring and patient. I guess it took about 15 minutes. She then asked me, what was I going to say? Since I'd seen what I assumed was Ku asterisk pid, I decided to tell her I'd been shaken and had an uneasy moment but it amounted to nothing and I was fine. She produced some forms which said we had talked with her and reviewed our symptoms. We were not waiving any future claims, but had been okay, in our own opinions, to go forward without seeing a doctor that evening. Now I was pulled directly into this odd tale. Michaela looked lovingly down at the little girl. We had docked, I guess 30 minutes before. Where are our other halves? I was getting agitated. I knew Henry to be faithful, 
but from the glimpse I got of him leaving, he was being more than gallant, if you know what I mean. Bob offered to go down and get them. He left and was back in five minutes, reporting no one was left on board, but us. As he explained, his phone pinged. I jumped back in. I grabbed my phone and looked at the text. Two beautiful couples. Both had been struck by arrows before. I tried to kick both of you, to make your lives even better. Michaela continued. He handed me his phone. I read this text about arrows. We were in Paris, not the Old West. I was thinking this is some bull sh. She glanced down at the baby. It seems something is amiss, she said in a lilting tone, is what I was thinking. Then the phone pings again, while I am holding it. The message told me to look over to my right. I did. There, like your daddy said was ku asterisk pid. Well, I wish it had been ku asterisk pid. It was Chumley, who was the cause of, not the solution to our issues. I started talking, again. All of a sudden, the cherub is talking. He tells us we were two special couples, who by total coincidence had been the first and last arrow shot by his tutor, Corridan. He had a chance to do something never done before. He tried. He'd screwed it up. Update 1. Michaela looked at me, like I should be observing, not talking, so I deferred. I looked at that little person, or whatever he is, and I asked him just what it was he was trying to do. I paused and saw that we were being approached by the young public relations woman. We decided we had to go. Bob and I talked on the way to get a cab. His hotel was a quaint old place just off the place window. Henry and I were staying out by the Arc de Triomphe at the George's V. The George's V is a world-class hotel and has been for years. We figured the two of them would go to the better of the hotels. We headed down the Champs d'Elysees and got to the hotel. The room was empty. We called Bob's hotel, no answer. I glanced at Michaela, who seemed to be looking to me to speak again. We were about to leave, and there he was, again. He told us Julia and Henry were at the other hotel, in bed. Michaela started to cry. I was going crazy. We asked him what he was doing. He told us he had called Corden and she would be here momentarily. She just materialized beside him. Really, you could see no difference between them. The conversation between them was in English, and not a word of it made sense. Chumley said he had an unbelievable opportunity to reinforce her first and last arrows. One of the couples was older, and, of course, he thought of an iridescent yellow arrow. The other couple was young and looking to start their family, naturally, he thought of Alizarin Crimson. Unfortunately, he decided to do it simultaneously with a trick shot. He missed two of the people and hit the other two with both arrows. He claimed it wasn't his fault. A very agitated Michaela took up the narrative. Here I am in the City of Lights. I am supposed to be with my husband of 50 years. We are staying in the most expensive room I have ever heard of, let alone occupied. But, instead of Henry, I am in a room with a gentlemanly young white man. To make bad things worse, Chumley is telling me my man is in bed with some teen-aged white girl. In fairness, Julia was 24. I added quietly. There was nothing fair about this. None of it. I started to lose it. Corden started screaming at Chumley asking him if he had any idea what this red and yellow arrow would do, combined. I started yelling at her, asking her if she could see who was in the room with her. Just reliving it, Michaela's voice still showed stress. I tried to settle the narrative down a bit. I said they should pretend we knew nothing about colored arrows, or what they did. They started explaining some of the things which we needed to know to figure any of this out. Apparently, it's like a rainbow. Big emotions are red, lesser ones, orange, then yellow, green, blue, and finally violet. But it is more complicated. No emotion is no emotion, so violet is simple. But big emotion can be love, hate, joy, terror, and so forth. Not to mention love can be for country, parent, child, lover, and on and on. So, this spectrum is not like a rainbow. 
It is more like a cone, a huge red end, and a point of violet on the other end. Michaela spoke up. Grace, if you're anything like me cones and rainbows and colors were more like some physics class. I was in Paris for love and my husband was in bed with a woman, who as it turns out is your mother. I started again. They told us the arrows were really not colored as they described to us. But it was an easy way for us to understand that a cherub's arrow, these days, might be for more or for other than romantic love. That's when Corridan shifted to talking about love. She told us about the early days of people. Love was not an excessively big deal. Survival was. But as we became more enlightened, more secure, we discovered love. She gave us a couple of examples of where the cherubs got it wrong. The first one was a king in England, in the 16th century. The cherubs were trying to help royalty be more faithful. A cherub shot Catherine and Henry, even though there was little hope. Catherine was older and had been married to Henry's older brother. Just before the royal couple had been married 25 years, Henry's current flame was Anne Boleyn. Bass tried to correct the earlier situation himself. He thought he could stop Henry chasing so many others if Henry and Anne were an item. Corridan told us she had seen him shake his head and take the blame for the whole debacle that followed. Henry decided he wanted this long marriage annulled. The Pope wasn't buying it. Henry did it anyway. Abolished the church, got excommunicated, and remarried. But now he was confused. Not long after he married Anne, he had her beheaded, and then had more wives than most of his subjects had baths in those days. Michaela was almost as agitated at the telling as she had been on Valentine's Day. I told her my man was making babies. Shouldn't we try to do something about that? Corridan looked at me and laughed. The little bee asterisk TCH laughed. She told me she had never seen it in more than five centuries. My Henry had locked himself in the bathroom and was crying. Seems his bride was expecting round two. He told her round two might be day after tomorrow. She had other ideas, and he ended up locked in the bathroom. Nothing was happening for a while. I started again. Corridan then shifted to Marie Antoinette. A cherub made Marie and Louis fall in love, forsaking all others. Their people were starving. Marie, forsaking all others, didn't care. When told they had no bread, she said let them eat cake. They were still in love when the people shortened them by a foot. Well, it was a different body part, but you get the idea. Update 2. Michaela took up the narration again. I looked at Corden and said we are not in the 18th century. I don't care about these people. Chumley calmed me down with some arrow. You better be doing that to that young white woman, or she'll kick my husband, and that would disappoint me. I don't want her to kick my husband. I want to kick my husband. I laughed. Corden said, you forget Adolf Hitler. I told her that was an interesting segue. Hitler is like a car accident. You don't forget, even though you don't want to remember. Then I asked why she was worrying that my memories of an historical cancer were fading. She told me the psychotics of history had a good range of emotions. They just didn't connect to the right events. We can't kick people's emotions, or they end up zombies or psychopaths. Michaela started again, showing her agitation was mounting. I asked her if some bad arrow caused world wars. She said no, they knew better. But she wanted me to know there were potentially serious downsides to trying to straighten people out with arrows. I reminded her, you tried to straighten me out with an arrow? She said it was merely like a Xanax, and that clearly, I was still emotional. I remember saying under my breath, I'd show her emotional, I forgot they could read minds, let alone hear whispers. She said we should take a cab to Bob's hotel. The cab ride was strange. Mind you, my husband who has been faithful for 50 years and has run off with a young white girl. I'm having conversations with cherubs. I am not properly concerned about anything going on, and I think the cab ride was strange. I sat in back on the right. Bob was on the left. Corridan was between us. I could see and hear her. Neither Bob nor the cab driver could. Chumley was sitting beside the driver. Bob and I could both see him. 
Bob could also hear him. The cab driver was unaware. It seemed like Chumley was telling the cab driver not to worry about anything. This was a normal cab ride, even if the Americans seemed weirder than most other Americans. Meanwhile, Corridan started talking to me. Bob was unaware of her presence, still. Corridan told me Henry and I were going to be the keys in all this. Mature people love, but they don't lust like younger ones. This was going to require an intervention by the big C. Michaela stopped talking and Henry panned the camera to Julia, who'd been silent for quite a while. Yeah, I guess this next part is mine. Grace, you'll be 18 when you hear this, and hopefully will not experience what I was experiencing for a couple of years yet. I have loved your father for so long. We planned our future together. He took my advice and risked everything, and we hit it big. We were going to go to Paris and conceive our first child. You'll find that your cycle can vary a little, and when you are really focused at having a family, your most fertile time comes when you need to be your most fertile. For us, it was right after that boat ride. Julia paused and took a drink of water. I must have been a sight. My new lover was unable to get it up and hiding from me. I was pacing around wondering what I was going to do. I would love to tell you I was wondering where your daddy was, but I was wondering where my next rutting was coming from. Suddenly, I turn and am faced by this little pudgy baby with a bow and quiver. Funny, my first thought was he would be too short to do me any good. The cherub said his name was Ku Asterisk Pid. Swell, I thought. Ku Asterisk Pid told me to stop and just feel my body. I asked if he meant with my fingers, or what? He said no, just sense, see what you feel. I did. I was pregnant. My face brightened, but I'd said nothing. And he said, you're right, you are. Suddenly, the lust passed. I felt somewhat normal, except I was in love with a nice, gentlemanly black man, whose name I could not recall. That seemed strange to me. But, searching my feelings, I was sure I loved all what's his name, even if he was currently hiding in the bathroom, whimpering. Ku Asterisk Pid told me I could not announce I knew I was pregnant at this moment to anyone, for at least eight months. After the Paris trip, I could announce I was pregnant, and everyone would assume it was Bob's. That would be okay. Now, think about it. Some mythical figure tells me to check my feelings. Magically I know I am pregnant, by a black man. He then tells me not to tell anyone, and it will be okay. What do you think I said? For reasons still unknown to me, I said okie dokie. I think, in part, it was the lust dying down. As crazy as I was, I was suddenly calm and knew my dreams of pregnancy had been fulfilled. Henry handed the tablet to me. I pointed it at Henry. All of a sudden, I was not alone in the bathroom. It was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I was totally in love and lust with this beautiful girl. We got to her room in just a couple of minutes from the boat. Not more than two minutes after that we were going at it. Now mind you, I was still able, but old people go about things more slowly. It takes a while. This was like magic. But for an instant I was young again. I tried to tell her at my age right away might be in the morning. But more than likely, it would be tomorrow night or the next night. She went after me like a starving person. I was more into staying. Now, I am in an old bathroom and a fat baby is telling me what to do. It had been an odd day and was getting odder. Ku Asterisk Pid told me he would explain what was going on in detail to the four of us, and we were all going to be happy. I was 69, locked in a bathroom in Paris, about to cry, and he told me I was going to be happy. Pardon me, I was a skeptic. Update 3 Julia returned to carry the narrative. Ku asterisk Pid had disappeared. I was suddenly at peace and hungry. I started gathering things to get dressed. I knocked on the bathroom door and out came Ku asterisk Pid and Henry. I went in to bathe and get presentable. One of the first things I noticed as we passed at the bathroom door was the lust in her eyes was gone. The woman had already changed. I was somewhat saddened, above the waist. I said. We got out of the cab, 
went into the hotel, and got in the elevator to go to our room. The man at the desk shook his head a bit. Earlier, he'd seen an older black man and young white woman clamoring into the lift. Now it probably appeared to him the reckoning was about to happen. He didn't see the two cherubs. I asked Michaela when did Corridan show up. We opened the door to the room, and as I let Michaela in, I saw Corridan shoot an arrow at Henry. At the same time, another cherub, who I learned was Ku Asterisk Pid, shot Michaela. The arrows struck simultaneously, and quickly they were in each other's arms. Henry was reassuring her, saying he loved her, and all would be all right. I recalled events of that evening. Ku Asterisk Pid looked at Chumley and shook his head. Trick shots? Really? You know you will go before the full Ku Asterisk Pid Bureau before the day is out. Chumley hung his head and said it was not his fault. Ku Asterisk Pid looked at him, but was talking to all of us. We have been around for centuries, and this has never happened before. We are revealed to people, life-changing events have occurred, and you say it is not your fault. It is not going to go well for you. You'll be very fortunate if your wings are not clipped. Chumley started to speak, probably in his defense, but he faded from view. Ku Asterisk Pid told us a little of their evolution. At first, there were a few, simple cherubs. We shot love arrows at couples. Life was simple. Oh, I mean people's lives. We cherubs are immortal. As man started making all manner of advances, and life got more complex, so did love. The role of the cherubs increased dramatically. There were so many kinds of love and people could be helped by cherubs, other than for romance. It required our numbers and skills to grow. Ku Asterisk Pid paused and looked pensive. I am trying to decide what to tell you. If I say too much, I'll get my wings clipped. Let me say this, we are divided. There are conservative cherubs who think our role should not evolve and progressive cherubs who believe we can play a larger role. As a consequence our role has increased, and as you have seen from the recently departed Chumley, not always successfully. I hope the powers will allow me to say this. Today we are just more than 66 million cherubs. A lot, but few compared to 7 billion people. He looked at Henry and Michaela, cuddling sweetly on the large, stuffed chair in the room. When you were courting, there were fewer than 100,000 of us. I know I cannot say how more cherubs come to be, but we doubled every 12 years, then 10. Now for a while it has been every two years. I often say you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cherub. Though I am chair of the Ku Asterisk Pid Bureau, I have been to date, unsuccessful at limiting growth. His little back stiffened. I am sure I can convince them now. We need to do better work, not more work. He smiled and said, Julia is still luxuriating in the tub. I have time to tell you about Corridan. He smiled and looked at her proudly. She is not yet 300, and as you may have heard only was an arrow-carrying cherub for about 50 years. Her successes were so great, and without a single failure, that we moved her into training. A few years ago, when she started, there were around 6 or 7 million cherubs. She falls further behind in her training duties, daily. Aside from all her wonderful qualities, Corden was successful because she began training in the 1700s and actively working in the 1960s. She shot her first, self-designed arrow at Henry and Michaela when they were in high school. She worked hard, found great young people with high potential, and helped assure they would have loving lives together. There are literally thousands of her couples all over the world. She did so well we had to move her into training. She is wonderful at that as well. When we approached her, she had one last special arrow, selected for Julia and Bob. With a huge string of successes in between, you were her last. Ku Asterisk Pid shook his head. By comparison, poor Chumley is 25 years old and had only 24 years of training. Some of it, by internet. He abruptly stopped. I cannot get into that, I'm told. We limit the arrows in his quiver. We will not let him create an arrow, 
and despite our precautions, he gets creative with trick shots. He has no idea what the risks are. The Bureau has thought it could maintain quality by limiting the participation of the younger cherubs. You can't seem to explain to them that today, since our population has doubled four times in the last decade, that 75% of all cherubs are less than five, and only slightly more than 5% are older than 10. At 25, Chumley is a senior cherub, and with regrets, I must say he is an idiot. Update 4, Michaela asked. What has this idiot done to us? Well, you get right to it, don't you? Ku asterisk Pid turned toward her. By the time you all leave, everything will be normal. Well, I can't say exactly normal. For right now, I can tell you that both couples will be in love as you were, and your lives will be wonderfully improved by your trip to Paris. Ku asterisk Pid paused and considered his words. Michaela, I am going to be honest, you need to hear this. First, in all these years no cherub has ever revealed her or himself to any person. We remain mythical. I had to reveal myself in order to explain these things. Secondly, if we've been successful so far, we have told you we can increase love between two people, and sometimes lust, but we can't really undo what we've done or really change people in any fundamental way. When I leave, Julia and Bob will be head over heels in love with one another. Neither will want to stray. He stopped to think, cocked his head, like he was trying to decide, then added. But, if Julia should suggest she and Henry need to be alone, that should be discouraged. I'm not sure I like that. Our marriage is based on trust. Now I have to limit Julia from being alone with men. Now, Bob, not men, just one man. She can't help it. She won't pine for him or love him, but alone in a room, she might decide she has to seduce him. There is more to tell you, but that is not for today. We are about to be rejoined. The bathroom door opened. Corridan was hovering just above the door. She had an arrow drawn. Ku asterisk Pid was pointing his bow at the door. As Julia opened the door, Ku asterisk Pid and Corridan both shot simultaneously hitting Bob and Julia, who were staring at one another. She immediately ran to him and sat on his lap. The two had eyes only for each other. Their gaze and kisses were making the room uncomfortable. Suddenly, Julia spoke. Sweetie, you would not believe what or who I saw in the bathroom. I laughed. Unfortunately, I would. Julia looked around. Oh my, two of them. And, and, oh my, how do I explain? Excuse me, sir. I'm not sure I know your name. Slot, Michaela said under her breath. Corridan floated over to Michaela and smiled at her. For reasons she didn't understand, it made Michaela feel more at ease. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Don't think about the answers a great deal. Just let your emotions loose and answer. Ku asterisk Pid looked at Henry. Henry. If I were to ask you how you feel about Bob, there, what would you say? Henry looked a bit confused. Well, I hardly know. Oh my goodness, my heart tells me he is my son. How could? Ku asterisk Pid looked at Michaela. And you? The same, I can't explain it. I love him like I am sure my own mother loved me. I feel it. She teared up the emotion was one she never expected to experience. I spoke too. Amazing. I feel the same warmth, loyalty, and love toward them that I do to my own parents. Julia started to speak and was cautioned, mentally, by Ku asterisk Pid, not to. The other three were given the suggestion that they had heard all they needed on the topic. We were suddenly more than friends, more like family. We paused from making the video. It was an ordeal to try to explain the inexplicable. What was to come was hardest of all. We had a wonderful time in Paris. The four of us often spent days together, but the Julia and I had evenings to ourselves. Ku asterisk Pid had warned me that one of the things he had to do to overcome Chumley's errant arrow was up Julia's. I told Ku asterisk Pid I'd suffer through the extra love. Update 5. We chatted about the last part of the video. 
what would we include? Should any part be left out? We decided Grace would be an adult when she saw it, and none of it should be left out. We enjoyed a snack and drink, while Grace was sleeping. Then we were back at it. Julia started. Grace, we had such a wonderful time in Paris. But I was worried. I saw Ku asterisk pit one more time, and he assured me I had only one path. And that was to hide the fact I knew I had gotten pregnant by Henry that night. So, I did. Henry said. We parted like the family Michaela, and I never had. It was so sad for us. Julia said we would get together at their home for Thanksgiving. It took the sting out of the parting. Michaela added. When we got home, Bob started calling us every Sunday afternoon. He'd talk to Henry for a while, then to me. Sometimes one or the other of us talked to Julia. It was always pleasant, but it wasn't part of the routine. Bob went from a stranger to the most important person in Henry and my lives in that short time. Oddly, it was just right. It felt so normal it struck none of us as odd. We had been home about a month. On a Saturday night, your mother told me she had missed her period and had taken a home test. She needed confirmation from a doctor, but there was no doubt she was pregnant. I was over the moon. We celebrated and laughed and loved and my first comment, not about the two of us was, I could not wait to tell Henry and Michaela. Not my parents, nor her parents. I thought your mother looked strange when I said it and asked her about it. I was prepared and told him the first to know probably should be my parents, then his, then the Jeffersons. He bought it, but he looked at me like I was hiding something. I gave him my most confident smile, but of course I was hiding the biggest secret of our marriage. I so wanted to tell him, but Ku Asterisk Pid had made me wait. Now, how could I say I have known for a month? And by the way, my dearest, you are not the father. No, however it was to come out, it had to be by Ku Pid's rules. I must tell you, when I thought about being honest, I got scared. When I decided this was in Ku Pid's hands, I relaxed. The pregnancy was easy. We did tell our parents first, but for some reason I was most excited to tell Henry. Grace had told me you were due on November 11th. Actually, she knew she was due on November 7th, 266 days after Valentine's Day. I called Henry and was talking to him, giving him the exciting news. He quickly shared it with Michaela, and she was caught up in our excitement, too. For reasons none of us know, we didn't worry about who your father might be. I asked Bob to get both of the Jeffersons on the phone. When he said they were on, I asked for the phone. Henry, Michaela, we want you to come celebrate with us. Come early for Thanksgiving. Move your arrival date to November 5th. I remember telling her it was early. We did not want to overstay. She told me with a firmness that showed she meant it. We were to stay a month. Firstborn babies tend to come when they want, and we were to be there. All we could say was we would make arrangements and be there on the 5th. Julia laughed. Starting about Labor Day, my life got complicated. Mom, your grams, had stayed with my older sister for both her births. She told me how invaluable she was. I told her no. I gave no reason. Like any reasonable, caring mother, she went behind my back and started full contact badgering of Bob. Your dad is a fearless man. Of course he came whimpering to me immediately. I continued. Sweet P, you can't imagine what two people have to do. To convince two sets of natural parents, they have no place in your home, for the most important event of our lives, because we would rather entertain a black couple, nearly fifty years our senior, and whom they have never met. We did what all good, God-fearing, loved ones do we lied. We lied often, we lied shamelessly, and we were good at it. Julia recalled her talking to her mother. Mom should have never gone behind my back to my husband. She gave us the perfect scenario, and it worked like a charm for weeks. She'd bully Bob. He'd stutter, stammer, and appear to be scared to death, which of course he was, and say he was not making progress with a pregnant woman, but he'd try. 
Meanwhile, my parents were also badgering me, and I could faithfully report that her parents were also on my case, and she refused to say yes to them. One day, I hung up, and it hit me. Why are we doing this? Why am I laughing with my wife while we make our parents, who both of us love, suffer? I was troubled and asked Julia. Grace, it was about Halloween. I had a week to go before the Jeffersons showed up, and I hoped, or trusted, or something, that Ku Asterisk Pid would also show up and make his promise to me come true. I did not lie to your dad, but I did give him a fake excuse. I told him my feet were swelling, my back ached, I needed rest. I could not handle his insecurities right then. Epilogue. The narrative stopped. Henry turned the tablet's camera off. We talked through how to present the next part, because it happened simultaneously, but not among all four of us. We decided the men would go first, then the women. I took the tablet and started recording Henry's account. We arrived about 3 o'clock at the airport and Bob was there to pick us up. Your mom didn't feel like a car ride. Grace, I have had so many friends over our lives, more black friends than white. But at the same time, I've had a number of good, white friends. Like everyone, I suspect. Most of my friends are about my age, more or less. When I saw Bob at the reception area, it was a feeling I'd never had. I was so happy to see him. It was important. That's the only way I can explain it. Michaela and I both hugged him, as though he were our own. Henry shifted himself, so that Bob could get both Henry and young Grace in the shot. We just jabbered on the way home, catching up. But how could we really be catching up? We'd met only eight months earlier, but we weren't getting to know one another. It was as though we already knew all about each other. Henry looked up. Bob, do you have anything you want to add? I didn't even turn the camera. No, just go until Ku Asterisk Pid came. I'll say some then. Our reunion at the house was nice. I could feel Michaela was still jealous of Julia. I don't know that anyone else could tell, but we'd been married too long for her to hide anything from me. She was all smiles, but a little tense. We talked, got settled, and Bob wanted to talk to me. Julia wanted to show Michaela the nursery. He stopped talking and looked at me. Let's go to your office. We made our way to the office, just the two of us. I nodded to Henry and started the video again. When Bob showed me this room, I wished I had one just like it. My office is small, just what I thought I wanted. This one has this nice seating area and the little bar. I was sitting in this chair, Bob in the facing chair, and suddenly between us hovered Ku Asterisk Pit. My thought was, I wonder what this is going to be about. He really wasn't talking, but I heard him as though he were. Bob heard about the same thing. I'll let him say what he heard. Ku Asterisk Pid told me at my advanced age, I was going to be a father. Somehow it didn't surprise me. He also said that, in order for the baby, you my dear Grace, to have the best life possible, she needed a younger dad and a loving home. She needed Bob to be her father. I handed the tablet to Henry. Grace, your gramps looked at me and I knew. He loved you more than anyone. And he was telling me I was your dad. Ku asterisk Pitt appealed to us logically more than emotionally. He told us he had decided to reveal himself because it was the only way to make sure everything came together as it had to. Ku asterisk Pitt told me, well both Henry and me, really, that we had to make sure Michaela was okay. This would be hardest for her. He told us that Henry knew he was too old to be a dad, and that to do so he'd have to break up a marriage. Henry is an extraordinary individual, who knows his duty, and being Gramps was his role. He knew it at his core. He had an heir, and the price was being Gramps. I had my first child. We went to Paris to conceive a baby, and that is what happened. I was going to get to raise our beautiful child and know your mother would be with me the whole way. Of course, you are your mother's child. Only Michaela needed to be shown her role. Henry set the tablet on Bob's desk, aimed so it would show both men. He sat down and looked back at the camera. 
This story is coming to you all at once. But most of it happened nine months ago. The visit from Ku Asterisk Pid was only last month. A part of the message he relayed to me was that my wife's role and Bob's role were the same. In one sense they were surrogates, or step-parents. But in the truer sense, Michaela's role and mine were precisely the same. Just as Bob and Julia's roles were the same, a conception from an errant arrow was really irrelevant. Other than it gave Michaela and I a chance at an heir we never thought we'd have. Given a choice, we'd not have done it. But thrust upon us, it was indeed a miracle. Henry, and I thought our account was good. We stopped and went back to the nursery. Would you two ladies like to see what we recorded? Julia looked to Michaela. Both shook their heads, no. Henry asked. We recorded our video with just the two of us. Would you like to do yours in a similar way? Again, two nods no. I want to start. Julia was almost twitching from nerves. I had been living in increasing terror well. That's too dramatic with a sense of dread that I was going to give birth to a baby. And it would be apparent my husband was not the baby's father. What bothered me the most was I knew I'd never get away with telling any of the other three. I didn't know. What would they think of me? We were now hours from your birth, and I needed an ally. I couldn't see how I could ask either of these wonderful men, so I told Nana I wanted to show her the nursery. Julia and Michaela exchanged a warm look and Julia continued. I didn't know what my chances were. I know if things had been reversed and Bob had been in bed with Michaela, I would have held a grudge. I could not see how she could be any different. We looked at your furniture, and I got the obligatory oohs and ahs, and suddenly, Corridan joined us. I was relieved at once. Michaela took up the narrative. Corridan looked at me first. She told us we really did not understand her tie to us. The cherubs had been looking for ways to help people, beyond adding a little lust to the moment. Many attempts had been made, and there were successes. Most of them were in broader areas of love. Helping a depressed mother love her child, helping extended family love one another, and things like that. Corridan wanted to find the right couples and help their love grow to enable them to be all they could be. She told us most of the cherubs did hours of research before launching an arrow. She said a cherub can know a lot in hours. She, on the other hand, worked for weeks to find the right people. She wanted people with a unique ability to be of help to one another in all that life threw at them. People who could be the ultimate success, as couples. Julia interrupted briefly. She told us the four of us were among only a few financially successful couples. Most were not and needed a particularly strong bond to help them through the difficulties life threw at them. Successful couples was not a monetary distinction. It was defined by how the two were able to support one another in good times and bad. Yes, she did say that, but for both of us, she said we offered qualities that would help our man be all he could be, and in turn, he would provide the kind of love and support to enable us to be what we wanted to be. Michaela paused and looked at the camera. Grace, it is an important lesson. It was more common in my day, and much more common in my mother's, but you should set your goals based on what you want to be. Society may have different ideas. You do not limit yourself by choosing what you want to pursue. You limit yourself by choosing what others want you to do. Oh my, I'm getting bad as the men. Your story is what we are here to tell. Corridan was telling us we were her most successful couples. Her first and her last. It seemed to me there was a, but coming. I got tired of waiting for it and asked what the catch was. Julia added. But Corridan was not quite finished with her side of the story. She told us she blamed the Ku Asterisk Pid Bureau. We nodded, and she said, Oh you probably don't know that much about the Ku Asterisk Pid Bureau. I told her it doesn't come up that often. Apparently, the huge numbers of cherubs scurrying about shooting people with arrows has caused more than a little chaos. But she claimed a big part of it was the Ku Asterisk Pid Bureau was soft on bad arrows, as they are called. Chumley, for instance got a swat on his bare behind, 
and nothing much more. They call him a cherub. He is a gadfly, with emphasis on the fly. Where is the work ethic? Where is the dedication? She was on her soapbox. I interrupted her, again. Excuse me. I am sure the worthiness of the liberal wing of the race of Ku Asterisk Pid is a fascinating topic for someone. I was hoping to know what you are doing about my husband and this young, pregnant woman. Julia got very serious. Grace, Corridan told me, I guess telepathically, to tell Michaela that you were her husband's child. As I told her, Corridan shot her with one last arrow. I thought Michaela would be furious. Instead she looked at me and wondered what would happen now. I saw fear in her eyes for just an instant. Corridan looked at me and told me at this same moment Henry had accepted he was in fact the child's grandfather. We had an heir from Chumley's error. I love my husband. We have given each other most of our lives. Henry was happiest in a role as grandfather, and I could join him as grandmother. Life would be good. They stopped the narrative and looked at one another. Is there anything else? I asked. Henry motioned to start the recording. Grace, you turned out to be a miracle child for Michaela and me. You helped us form a family and give two older people something to look forward to for the rest of our lives. Chumley may be incompetent, but he surely blessed us. They all agreed it was a great finish to the video. The Jeffersons would fly out mid-afternoon the next day. It had been a great visit. We enjoyed a great dinner and conversation, then retired for our last evening. The end. Thanks for watching. Remember, revolving time exists because of your support. So take care of yourself and see you soon with another story.